we have a good, good father. You know that, don't you? Um, and th that other song, um, the, the You Are For Me, I mean, oh my goodness, I want to talk about the providence of God this morning. And, and I'm using these two verses, and you may think that I'm going to stick with uh, this first one. Uh, this is Romans 8, uh, verses 28 and 29, out of the New International Version, where the Apostle Paul writes, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purposes. And, and I'll say a thing or two about that, but... This next verse, believe it or not, is the one that I want to emphasize when I get there. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Father, uh, help us this morning, uh, both the speaker and those who listen, to receive the Word of God, knowing that it is that uh, double-edged sword that cuts asunder so finely in our lives that it can discern spirit and soul. And, and God, we just need your ministry this morning. By the Spirit's power, authoring this Word, speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And what did the church say? Amen. Okay, you can sit. Um, I'll unpack these two verses uh, in a minute. <clears throat> when Christian Herter, and it's spelled H-E-R-T-E-R, -E -E from anyone that might be from the state of Massachusetts, when Christian Herter was the governor of Massachusetts, um, he was running hard for a second term in office. One day after a very busy morning of chasing votes, uh, one afternoon, actually, he stopped in at a church barbecue. They had kind of a buffet line set up outside the facility. And, of course, he was, <laughs> to be honest with you, he was trying to get votes. So he stopped in, and there were a bunch of people there. And he was famished. He hadn't had a chance to eat the entire day. So uh, he got in line and uh, uh, worked his way up to the front of the line and... Uh, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving the chicken. Uh, she put a piece, one piece on his plate, and turned to the next person in line. Excuse me, Governor Herder said. Do, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? I'm pretty hungry. And uh, the woman said, sorry, uh, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. Uh, but I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said again. Only one piece of chicken per person. Now, Governor Herder was ordinarily a, a pretty modest and unassuming man. Uh, but <clears throat> he decided, uh, as hungry as he was, he was going to throw his weight around a little bit. And, and so he said, um, ma'am, do you, do you know who I am? I, I'm, the, I'm the governor of this great state of Massachusetts. And... Uh, the woman just looked right back up at him and said, Sir, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. <laughs> One piece of chicken per person. Move on down, Mr. Governor. Move on down. See, <clears throat> so in, in Romans 8, uh, we, we discover that our good, good father is just like that woman in the chicken line or in the the barbecue line she she was in charge and our father's in charge of our lives that's what we that's what we mean when we use the word the providence of God uh, God is in control Ecclesiastes 3 in verse 11 I love this verse it, it simply said he and it's talking about God has made everything beautiful in its time he has also set eternity in the hearts of men yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Um, for the person who has truly placed full authority in God's hands, this verse, Romans 8, 28, and also what I just read to you from Ecclesiastes, bring us much hope because it means that literally in everything, not just the good stuff, 
and even not just the bad stuff, but in everything, God has purpose in what's going on in our lives. And I know this can get sticky, and there's a lot of caveats, and there's a lot of rabbit trails that I could run off after, but I want this congregation this, this morning to, to just kind of stay right in the middle of the lines of what's being said here. Our God loves us to the point that He has everything about our lives under His control. Now, can you amen that? It's true. It's, it's a true statement whether we believe it or not. Another way to say it is there's no such thing as chance. I just absolutely do not believe in chance. I, I don't. I mean, I've never been a betting person where chance is a part of what happens when you put down your wager. But I'm not a betting person either in my life with God in Jesus Christ. I know that through the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, that He is in charge of me and my household. And I can say it like Joshua did thousands of years ago. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And, and they, those two boys of mine, <laughs> they haven't always served the Lord. Uh, there were some times when they got out there in left field. One of them's probably here listening to me right now. And he's the one that's sinking down in his seat right now. Um, and I'm not going to tell a lot of stories on either one of them, but I still believe that my God has it all in his control. And if they came to know God, as the, both of them did, then somewhere down the line, I was assured in my heart and my mind that they were going to come back to him. And there are people that are sitting right here within the sound of my voice who have children and grandchildren who aren't following the Lord. But I'm here to tell you we serve a God of sovereignty and providence, and if He's promised you, as He has, their soul salvation, you can be assured somewhere down the line He's going to ring it up, and they're going to come back to God. I'm just telling you, it's that simple. And you say, well, yeah, preacher, <laughs> both of your kids are back in church, and, and we see on Facebook that you have the five most beautiful grandchildren in the universe, and, and you know, there's, there's just a lot of things there. Then you look at my situation and Miss Joyce's, and you say, man, you guys are, you, you guys are good. <laughs> but we can tell you about times when it wasn't so good. And we were hanging on for all that we had. This is resonating with some of you. We remember those times. And there were times that when uh, there were nights. It was so bad in the night. There were times in the night when I just wondered if God was really going to do what he had promised and I have lived almost 63 years, and I have come to find out that he does what he promises. And they're back, both of them. One of them's co-pastoring a church in Santa Rosa Beach, and the other one and his beautiful wife and family just hang around Generations United. See. They really are the prettiest grandkids in the universe. I, I wasn't making that up, okay? I wasn't making that up, I promise you. And I'm good if you think yours are. We're, we're okay, okay? I've actually had people in the church tell me, I know that God is in complete control, but it seems here lately sometimes he lets things fall through the cracks. I'm here to say... Listen, <laughs> I know why that person says that sort of thing. I get that. But I'm just telling you, nothing falls through the cracks. God sees it. He's working it. He knew about it before he threw the universe out into space. That's the providence of God and the sovereignty of God. He knew your kids and your grandkids before there was a universe. And he has a plan for them. And I'm just telling you. 
they're going to come back to God somewhere. They're going to come back to God. Nothing falls through. Job 37 and verses 5 and 6. This is the NLT. God's voice is glorious in the thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. He directs the snow to fall on the earth and tells the rain to pour down. Now, just think about that a minute. You know, these poor weather people. <laughs> I mean, I check the weather because I'm trying to get an idea of what's going to happen in the next few days. But if it's anything past two or three days, you can just pretty much say, nah, that might be or that might not be. We serve a God. We love a God. We serve a God who loves us that directs the fall of the snowflakes. For those of you silly enough to live north of the Mason-Dixon line, but for those geniuses in the congregation who have decided to live here, he directs the rainfall. Now, every once in a while, he'll mess with us, and he'll let it snow, and we just go crazy over half an inch of snow around here. You know, people up north are going, whatever, a half an inch of snow, what's your problem? I'm just saying that God is so sovereign in this universe and on this particular planet that he directs the fall of the snow and the fall of the rain. Do you think that he can take care of you? If he can handle the, the, the weather cycles of this planet, he can take care of you and I. Another, another scripture, I love this, Proverbs 16. I'm going to read verse 9 and then verse 33. <clears throat> we can make our plans, Solomon says, but the Lord determines our steps. Amen? Amen? And then down in verse 33, I like the way that, I think this is the, uh, yeah, this is the NLT. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Now, that's a great translation, isn't it? Listen, we, we, we just think we've got this thing under control, you know. All right. I'm going to spin it out, and you would think I've been gambling the way I just did that, right? Did, did, did you see that little loop that just kind of sends the dice out there in just the right manner? No, I haven't been. I'm just saying to you that we can throw the dice all we want to. God's going to always determine how they fall. That's just our God. That's our good, good Father. That's how He works. There's no such thing as chance. No way. Sometimes to see God's providence, and I'll say it many times, to see God's providence, it takes a little bit of time. I would have liked the very first time that I prayed for those two boys of mine for it to get straightened out right then and there. How many of you know that very seldom happens? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes providence is not understood until you've walked through it. And as you come out on the other side, it's like the, the little light bulb pops up over your head and over your heart. And it's like, oh yeah, my God was in control. He had that. There's, it just keeps coming back to me. You are in this room and you're hearing what I'm saying. And it's something that I want and I know God wants for you to buy into. It's not going to solve all of your problems for you to understand the providence of God. I wish it would, but it won't. But it will put you in your mind and in your heart and in your life in the hands of a provident God. And that's where you want to be when the stuff of life begins to happen. I love this passage in Acts. I know I'm throwing a lot of scriptures, but Acts 17, verse 26 and following, Paul writes, or excuse me, Luke, no, Paul, no Luke, <laughs> whatever, I'll get it. From, from one man, he made every nation of men. Now, what one man was he talking about? Adam. He was talking about Adam. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth 
And he, still talking about God, determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And then, and this is Paul preaching on Mars Hill, by the way. Luke is just recording it, so I, I, both of my inaccuracies were accurate. And so, yeah, they, they, they were. And in verse 28, Paul preaching to those Greek philosophers, he said, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. Those of you that are charismatic Pentecostal, remember we used to sing that song based off of that, and we would spin and turn and jump, and, you know, in him we live and move and have our being. You know, and we go over and over with that. It was just a powerful worship experience, so powerful I got sick and tired of that song, you know. <laughs> it was like, go away for a while. So I'm coming back years after time. Those of you in this place that have been here as long as I have and longer know we used to do it right here. We sure did. Great song for, you know, a decade or so, and then it was time to go away from it. But he, 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 he says that to them. He says, for in him we, we live and we move and we have our being. And then, look how he concludes that part of the sermon. He says, as some of your own poets have said. He's quoting Greek philosophers now. And he's saying, we are his offspring. That ties back to what he said, all of mankind came from one man. And his name was Adam. He, he tied it together. And, and, and let's, let's unpack this passage a little bit. Uh, God's telling us first that uh, God places everyone in time and space. And though I, I know the context is talking about the race of man, uh, I still, I can pull that into my own life and know that everywhere I've gone, he's led me to that place. Whether it turned out to be a great, wonderful, hallelujah experience or it turned out to be something where I'm ready to move on, God. Let's get this train on the tracks. You know what I'm talking about. He takes us to the places he wants us to be. Secondly, we're created for God. And according to this passage, he does that so that we might seek him out. See? We're his, and therefore, we need to be about the business of knowing what he is all about. He wants us to seek him. And thirdly, from uh, and in God, we have our purpose. Everything that we are uh, from God and in God's presence in our life, we find our purpose. And this brings us back to our text. And guys, put it, uh, Romans eight twenty eight back up there. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I just almost this morning, if you'll allow me, I'm going to let that one stand alone. You can figure out what that means, right? You are the called. You are beloved of God. So he's working all things to your good. Now, what that verse is not is some kind of dirty band-aid that we try to stick on anything that ever happens in our life. You know, and what I would suggest to any of you that have been called into the presence of someone who has, has just experienced a tragedy or a loss of life, please do not just stand up in their face and quote this to them. Yes, your mother just died tragically in that car accident, for we know that all things, there's an overarching truth that's bigger than us just trying to localize what the apostle is saying there. Of course we know that all things work together for good, but that's not something you tell someone who's just suffered loss. You just go and be with them. The best thing you can do is be very, very quiet around them. Isn't that right, Miss Linda? How many times have we done that down through the years? We've been called into homes She's getting the food together, and I'm just going there, and I may have a million things running through my mind to say, and at the end of the day, at the end of the experience, the fact that we were there was what made the difference. They just need you to be there. They don't need 
a, a teaching, <laughs> you know, that, that'll come later. It, it, it'll happen. God, uh, as their father, will provident, providentially speak into their lives. That's okay for me to say all that, isn't it? Okay, well, I was going to anyway. Um, what I want to talk about is that 29th verse, guys, if you'll put it up there. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, those of you that have some theological training, don't get on the edge of your chair because I'm not going to dive off into predestination, you know, uh, whether the election of God is a Calvinist theory that we must accept or an Arminian theory that we must accept. Uh, you know, I, I don't really care to go, but <laughs> this old Arminian, I will tell you that much because I believe our choice does have something to do with our soul salvation. This old Arminian has over the last few weeks, as I've begun to prepare to share this with you, I've sighted a little bit closer to my Calvinist brothers. Now, they still check my name tag, and it says, Terry Poole, Arminian, okay? I haven't gone over to the other camp. Because when you get way over into their camp, then there's nothing about choice. Uh, you know, they just, God just picked out who he was going to save in eternity, and they were going to get saved whether they wanted to or not. I don't believe it works that way. There's too many whosoevers in the Scripture. Are you following me? Whosoever will. Uh, that doesn't sound like a predetermined number of people to me. So, so that's all I'm going to say about all that kind of stuff. But what I'm going to tell you, as I, tell you, as I told you, I sidled it a little bit closer to the Calvinist camp because... To them, this verse is very powerful because the providence of God is so complete that He has all of our decisions and everything that happens to us all figured out and known in eternity past. And you say, well, why hasn't He had a nervous breakdown by now? Because He's God. He can foreknow who's going to be saved and who's not. He can know these things without inflicting his power on their choice to accept him. And the way that it works, Robert Bear, if you're in the house, you knew I was going to get here. I believe. See, when Adam fell, he took everything with him. How, do you understand that? Paul, in this very chapter, talks about the day when the environment and nature and the ecology will all be redeemed. And he said that nature is even now groaning for that to take place. Because when Adam and Eve fell, they took everything down with them. See, everything. But I'm telling you that God, in his foreknowledge, knew what was going to happen. And, and it wasn't like he came up with a different Band-Aid and said, well, Jesus, I'm sorry, sir, but you're going to have to die on the cross. All of that was foreknown, the foreknowledge of God. He knew all of that and loved us enough to let it go down that way as we make our choices. But when we fell, this is the danger of preaching without notes, when we fell, we lost the ability to interface with God like Adam and Eve could. Remember, they were having daily conversations with God in the garden. And then what happened when they fell? Not only did they, could they not hear him anymore, but they didn't want to hear him anymore. So they ran. They were ashamed. They ran and hid themselves. And here's what I want you to catch. God went looking for them. Now, now, I know that's like, okay, great. But I'm telling you, that's huge. He didn't just go looking for them. He's been in the process of going to look for all of us. You could not interface with God. Robert, the theological term is prevenient grace. It's the grace that comes before salvation grace. In other words, in other words, God is looking for us to the extent that even in our totally fallen and depraved condition, 
that he loves us so much that he comes looking for us by the Spirit's drawing. Jesus said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. That's what he was talking about, in my opinion. Now, some of my Calvinist friends are a little bit, been out of shape with me on that. But I just tell them, you're going to get over it. You are. Because that is what I think is the full counsel of God. I think in his foreknowledge, that means literally when you study the, re the Greek word, it means that he foreloved us. He foreloved us before there was a universe. He loved us so much that he had to make a way for a depraved race of beings to heed, to hear and then heed the call of the Holy Spirit. That's the foreknowledge of God. And yes, can't we give God the ability? <laughs> it doesn't matter whether we can or not because he's got it. But can't we give God that omnipotent, omniscient possibility of knowing how mankind would respond to his son and thereby, according to the next part of that verse, predestining them. Knowing that some would heed that call, knowing that others would not. And from the beginning, he knew how everybody's choice would go down without influence in it. It was still up to man to respond to what God was trying to do. And you say, okay, man, we're out in theology land now. Well, let me land this thing, okay? He knows that some of you are sick in your body. He foreknew it. Doesn't mean he made you sick, but it means he knew that would happen. It's a fallen world that we live in. Even after conversion and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, we're still mortal. <laughs> Things can still go wrong. He knew that your daughter would drift away. He knew that. And he still foreloved her enough that somewhere down the pike you can expect that she's going to come back into the fold. He foreknew it. And therefore, everyone he foreknew, he predestined. And listen, it's not just a wide open predestined. It is a predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If Romans 8.28, all things work together for good, is going to make any sense at all to me and my limited ability to comprehend this stuff, then I've got to know there's a reason. There's an ultimate bottom line reason, and that reason is this. He wants you and I to look as much like Jesus Christ as we can. Now, that's a good thing. Now, it, it gets awful. <laughs> Do they still use the word gnarly? It, it, it gets awful gnarly sometimes. It gets uh, just downright ugly on occasions. But he's taking all of that. He's, he's working in spite of all of that. You'll never get me to believe that God inflicts you with cancer. I won't ever believe that. But he can take that and he can glorify Jesus Christ in your life. And it's worth it. It's worth it. It's not, of course it's worth it when we enter through the gates of glory on the other side of the river, as some old timers like to say, <coughs> not me, I'm not that old, but some people do. I'm talking about it's worth it right now. Church, it's worth it right now. It's worth it right now. He's turning us into the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And I know that the word Christian has fallen out of vogue. And okay, well, it has, so whatever. But that word was coined not by Christians, but by a city full of heathens. I want you to hear me. The city of Syrian Antioch. Ed, help me. I think that's where it happened where God planted a church and, and the apostles called Paul and Barnabas in to help get the church going. And, and they began having services 
And they began going out beyond the walls and, and sharing their faith. And so a heathen, multi-God worshiping group of people decided, well, they keep talking about this Christ. Let's call them little Christs. And that's what the Greek etymology is on the word Christian, little Christ. You say, well, that's pretty big. I don't know that I can do that. Well, I know you can't. <laughs> I can't either. But God is working in our life. He's predestined us to be conformed to that very same Jesus I'm talking about. That's the whole purpose of what's going on in our lives. Psalm 37, 23, and I need the worship team back now. <laughs> it, it was plan A, Garrett. <clears throat> The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every <clears throat> detail of their lives. I, and I found this somewhere. I don't even have a quote that I can offer, but one fellow said it like this. The Lord orders our stops as well as our steps. The Lord orders our stops as well as our steps. Because sometimes in my way of thinking... God can kind of have me on this roll and everything is just shaping up and going and just moving and man, everything is just wonderful and then it just stops. That's because God orders our stops as well as our steps. That's what it's all about. To be loved by a good, good father. That's who he is. That's who he is. And I'm loved by him. That's who I am. That's who I am, the object of his love. Now, I don't mean to confuse you guys. I still want you to come back to that. You are for me. One more scripture. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6. Plant your seed in the morning. Keep busy all afternoon. For you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. That's the NLT. The PRV uh, version of that is just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You say PRV, uh, what is, that's the pool revised <laughs> standard. There. Yeah. God never talks about running. He does occasionally talk about flying. But in the New Testament, in particular, the Apostle Paul talks about walking in the Lord. And I just see it as a, I've got enough grace to do this. And now I've got enough grace to do this. Is this, is this connecting? I've got a grace to do this. That's how we live for God. We can make plans. We can make plans. We can get those dice all in our hand and we can use that little sling that I showed you and throw them out on the table. But God's going to always decide how they fall. That's the providence of God. Just put one foot in front of the other. All right. We sang that song this morning. And Garrett, I almost took my liberty of coming up. I'm glad I didn't because good, good father really was good. But I almost came up. Oh, Garrett's over here. Uh, <clears throat> I almost came up right there and just said, let's, let's just let's massage this a little bit. But you know why I didn't? It's because I just think God wants this to begin to steep. How many of you drink hot tea? Do you, are there what get with it church come on hot tea is good Earl Grey if you haven't tried it it's just outstanding but you, you, you put that bag into the hot water right and you can walk off and, and do this and do that but if you're in a hurry you stay with the bag and what do you do you just keep dipping it well I just think God wants I know I know that I know God wants some of you to steep in this truth because you're, you're starting to get desperate. You're, you're ready 
to punch out. Maybe I'm talking to some marriages right now. I think I know I'm talking to some sicknesses in this place. But don't, don't, don't pull that, that drag chute out. Let's keep that parachute packed and let God decide all of that. Let's stay in what God's doing. He's just steeping us. They're going to sing and then, then I'm going to pray.